Hey y'all, coming to you from the Building Science Symposium, also known as Building Science Summer Camp. I've got Bart with me. Bart gave a presentation yesterday that was friggin' unbelievable. Bart, that was phenomenal. Absolutely hilarious, number one. And number two, just great to see another builder, remodeler, carpenter, crushing the building science on some projects and being being able to share all that knowledge with with a great crowd well i uh i it was i talk about great crowd like that is about as good as it gets i mean those guys everybody was into it every you know i fed off of them they fed off of me and uh and it was it was a rush for sure and the giants are here man all the big teachers in building science i mean not just Steebrick, but so many dudes that we've learned from over the years yeah i mean to have to have people like you know john straub and mark la liberté and joe and and blasnick and you know betsy come up to you and say that you know you really did a good job that's like those are like my heroes so totally yeah me too all right bar, a couple questions for you right. you know you're in a totally different climate zone than me i'm in texas it's friggin' hot where i am you're in Colorado and it's crazy cold. Yep. What are the hot topics, though, for you in the building science world? What are the things that you're thinking about? Give me a couple, a couple that are off the top of your head. Well, I think, I think, like I talked about in the um, presentation, the one open-ended um, discussion that we're, we're starting to have and trying to figure out is the. Uh, well, I mean, it's Colorado, right? <laughs> you know, we like ourselves some weed, and uh, so the grow room situation and and from all aspects from the fact that you know you you, know, you you can grow six plants as an individual so you know you put three you know snowboarders into a temporary house and condo whatever it may be at 10,000 feet up in a ski resort and they all want to grow a plant and you know or six and uh and you know you got a, a pretty good sized grow operation all of a sudden in in a, in a building that's not really set up for it you know you know 80 degree you know temperatures at 60 degrees relative humidity when it's negative 20 out is a it's a hard thing over that substrate that's not used to it yeah no doubt yeah so and that and that goes not just for that type of situation but now we're starting starting to see that you know on the commercial end those guys are starting to ramp up and more and more and we're getting um you know grow like steel building shops retrofitted into um you know pot growing facilities now maybe down at the at the lower elevations where it's mixed you know you don't get extreme colds you don't get extreme hots and all that stuff it's a little easier to manage I'm just kind of curious how it's going to happen up up in the big up, up in you know up up in uh, altitude. And where do you think the failures are going to are going to come? Where what are you seeing out there? And I know you did you showed some slides of remediation you did mm -hmm. where somebody was growing a ton of weed in their in their basement basically. Yeah. What kind of stuff are you seeing in terms of indoor air quality or mold growth or things like that? Well, I think I think it's the it's the elevated moisture levels, you know, and and uh, and, and getting that moisture uh, pushed out, you know, into building, uh, you know, systems, walls, roofs, things like that, you know, with air leakage out through and then the condensation, um, you know, spit and siding off of buildings, whatever it may be in the steel buildings, that condensation, you know, and drain back and, and, um, problems with that during the, during the, uh, you know, once you hit February, we start warming up just enough where all that, that condensation drains back. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, indoor air quality is, is a big one too on that, not just because of the high elevated moisture but man let me tell you the smell is is pretty bad is it really? yeah i mean you can i mean the one that building we were working on i think they were only growing it was only 12 or 14 plants and like the whole building just smelled like you know a pack of dead skunks it was just like <laughs> It's horrible, you know, and like the, the beautician upstairs is like, this is ridiculous, you know, like my clients are starting to complain. So, yeah, it's going to, it's, 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 you know, and then that guy is going to take that and pump it outside. And now the neighbors are going to start complaining, you know, so, it's, so we, we got some, it's not that we can't do it. We just got to figure out, it's going to be interesting to sit back and watch and be like, all right, how is this all going to play out in the end? Yeah. yeah. So Bart, let me, let me switch gears a little bit, you know, and thinking about what we've learned in the last couple of days, um, what's, what, what do you think is a pressing issue for builders in Colorado over the coming years? Um, I think, uh, well, I, I think the biggest problem we're going to run into from my point of view, cause I'm a carpenter. So when I look at how technical it is to build a house these days, 
the code's getting, you know, higher and higher. I mean, really, once you get the 2015 code, we're starting to get even into just like a, almost a performance-based code, really. It's almost easier to go that direction. And so you're going to have to know, even as a carpenter, like, how does this all go together? Like, how do all these pieces go together? How do they go together properly? Yep. Especially at where we are, we see such acute failures. Um, you know, spray foam's great, but spray foam not implied right and misses areas in like you know an overframed area of a roof you know we do thermal imaging on a lot of these things and we find out like hey listen you miss that whole seam that's going to be a that's going to be a really acute air leakage and moisture issue yeah. right there you know yeah. because we've tightened up everything else so much and if they don't get the hrv in track then you know it's it all kind of compounds so i think i think the biggest thing is going to be bringing like what we consider the the you know the carpenter up to speed with everything yeah. and they're going to become more of a technical expert than we think and, and they need to be you yeah. know because those are the guys that are installing our windows mm -hmm. and those are the guys that are putting the flashing on and we need them to go hey we got a problem here time out bart you know i was at the job site and now you know i know you had to run to meet a prospect yeah but i saw this this and this happen and i told those guys to hang on because i could tell that wasn't right yeah and and that's where it's going to come down to and <clears throat> sorry i think third party um I, I, I well i think there's a couple different things i think there's a there's going to be a, a room for like a third party building science kind of what Joe does, you know, where they do envelope specialties, yeah. Yeah. you know, and I think there's going to be a, a more and more of that. But I also think the building departments are going to have to take on inspections of flashing. Yeah. They're going to have sure. to do window flashings. Yeah. They're going to have to do, you know, roof to wall flashing. They're going to have to do, you know, proper install of the different, um, of the different uh, air barriers and, uh, and drainage planes, yeah. you know, because like well, talking to a guy today, he's like, well, when you put on our, our, our uh, liquid applied membrane like you got to be able to not see the color through it like then you know that you have enough you know mills right. and right. it's like well you know the billing department you know they barely know that you know most of the time they come in they look around they go oh well there is insulation sweet and <laughs> they sign it off and they're out yeah. so you can't do that anymore yeah. you know and, and, you know, in the building department, they got a ton on their plates, no, nothing against yeah, those guys. But, totally. you know, they're dealing with life and safety, which is phenomenal. We don't want people dying in our houses. Mm -hmm. But what's that? What good is that as a builder if that house rots out on 10 or 15 years or ends up with a big mold issue? Yeah. You know, those are just as big of a life safety issue for me as a builder as anything else. And they're certainly super reliable or super liable on my part if I'm building houses that have those problems. Yeah. And I think I think with builders coming in, like the one we were working on that I gave a presentation, on like I know who the builder is and it's an eight-year-old building that is completely failed and it's and it's full-on details yeah. like it's just perfect example of like you know guys just doing what they do yeah. and it's not uncommon yeah. in Texas too yeah you know and, it, and, and well yeah I, I don't think that's you know it's special by any means to us. It's like when I go investigate somebody's house, you know, and I tell them all the things that are wrong. I always have to tell them like, well, unfortunately you're not special. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is, I see this all the time. That's why I know about it because it's prevalent. And so, you know, whether that makes them feel better or not, <laughs> I don't know. Not <laughs> all right. Last question for you, Bart. Let's say you're building your own house. Mm -hmm. You've got at least a medium budget, if not a high budget. Mm -hmm. You can really pull from all the systems that you know and have learned about over the years. Give me 10 things that you would do on, on your own personal house if you build the next one. Um, size. You'd be small. Nice. Um, the last last uh, five years, I've been living in 675 square feet with my daughter half time, and um, and we've really learned how to live small, mm -hmm. um, and w and with a garage space, and um, and you know added onto that. But um, I I'm embracing that in a big way. I think we take care of a lot of problems smaller now. It's America, you yeah. know. I mean, you want to build a big house? Great. I don't know, man. The tiny house movement has taken off in America, and I think it's yep. people, uh, for me, the small, for me, where the rubber meets the road is you can build a better house 
in, with less money if you go small. You know, that 600 square foot house, if you had, you know, even 50,000 or 100,000 more dollars, but you're building a house three times as big, it's going to be that much worse. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, creating small problems and not big problems, yeah. you know, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that, you know. Yeah. I owned a small house in Denver uh, when we first bought it, the first house I ever bought, it was 25 by 25. Yeah, yeah. And the best thing about it is none of the projects were all that big. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they were all pretty small <laughs> projects, you know? That's awesome. So uh, we, um, but that, I think size would be something I'd really concentrate on. And the other thing I would concentrate on, which I think the industry has to um, start understanding, like we don't have to design the same layouts everywhere yeah you know like in in my in my area everybody we got our skis bikes all our gear for all these you know your kayaking gear your biking outdoor gear sports. all outdoor sports you know your 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 nordic gear your, your regular ski gear your your mountain biking gear your you know all this stuff but nobody has a 12 by 12 mudroom right you know what I'm saying? And so like, we need that. Like, and you talk and people will say it, they go, I just need a massive mudroom to come in and put all my shit away. But then nobody builds it. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the funny yeah. part is I've been hearing it for years, but there's, I think there's one house I've ever been into in Crest Butte in the last year that like, well, a modest size house. I mean, some of the really big mansions have that, but I'm talking about like a standard, you know 1500 to 2000 square foot house that you know any average person is like little smaller bedrooms and a big ass mudroom yeah you know totally. and so those types of things and not get ding for it on an appraisal yep. because it doesn't fit into the normal design layout that you know we, we've come accustomed to yeah, so cool. i think that's a big one and I, the big thing I'm struggling with now, especially on the smaller houses, is a uh, heating system for our area. Um, because the we typically do in-floor, you know, um, oh, yeah. uh, radiant. We don't really don't have much um, forced air. But, um, you know, it's it's basically like the, the equipment and setup for, for an in-floor radiant on like a 1,200 square foot house versus a 2,000 square foot house really aren't that much. Mm -hmm you know you're almost spending the same amount of money because yeah. you only get so small of a boiler right. and then once you get into the efficiency levels that that you're spending a lot of money on a system that isn't isn't um you know working a whole lot so i'm looking at trying to develop um or not develop but find some alternative heating sources for the energy efficient small home nice. that just don't just really it's cost like yeah. it's like the in-floor works it's it's that's not a problem it's just an expensive ordeal yeah you know for for the amount of what you're getting out of it yeah, in the I end you know so um so you know trying to get uh maybe some of these air source heat pumps to work right and be quieter please and i got some great ones in texas really? and they've got some of the manufacturers are good to like you know minus 10. they're still they're still full heat capacity or yeah. minus five something like that i think it's just where we are a lot of people aren't aren't used to the fan yeah. and if you got a noisy fan you know it's right. just it, it so we just need it just needs to be quiet yeah, you know that's that. the problem yeah. you know so um you know the nice thing about the in floor Nothing. you don't hear you got zero noise yeah, you don't hear it so and if you know and if you put in a, a you know forced air i think would be a better way to go um in the long run with what we want to do i think that's a definite a a, a, a valid mm -hmm. direction to go but I'm, I'm very interested in something even you know maybe some finding something else from that yeah. see what's out there yeah so bart so good to talk to you man i wish you the best in colorado hey if people want to uh get a hold of you or uh or find your website what's the best way to find you best way to find me is uh at a website uh you can you can contact me through the website if you want it's uh bart at or no i'm not giving out the, the email because <laughs> i don't check emails that much <laughs> i'm horrible on email um it's uh b2 that's bart two so b2 building science uh, dot com and uh, cell phone. If you want to give me a call, go ahead. It's nine seven zero nine zero one eight 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 one. Be expect a couple calls from my followers out there. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't mind talking. Bart, thanks, man. I, I suck at typing. I really so. appreciate it. We will see you next year at Building Science Cummer Camp 2017. Yep, rock on. All right, buddy. Thank yeah. you.